Hi, I'm Dr. J, today's host for the Ask the CISO interview, sponsored by Fortinet. I have with me today the Chief Security Officer of MasterCard, Ron Green. Welcome. Hey, thank you for having me today. Glad to have you. So I want to start like way back into the very beginning, mm-hmm. okay? I remember when I was in high school, I was going to be one of two things, a DJ or a pediatrician. It's like two completely different areas, right? Yeah, yeah. Were you thinking about cybersecurity when you were in high school? Not at all. I didn't think so. I didn't think so. I, I definitely wasn't. At what point did it become a potential career choice for you? So, you know, in high school and middle school, um, I used to do the, you know, cracking of games mm-hmm. and things like that. So I, I had a lot of exposure to computers, but I never saw, you know, cyber or programming as a career field that I was going to go into. I was going to go into law enforcement. I was going to be a cop. Mm-hmm. Um, I grew up around cops you know, my whole life. After high school, went to West Point. Uh, and I went to West Point because my dad said, uh, look, you, you can't be a cop right away. You got to go to college. Uh, so I chose to go to West Point. And at West Point, I thought I'd be career army. Um, but then I just felt like I wanted to be a cop again. My dad said, uh, no, you have to go federal. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, I joined the Secret Service. And there is where cybersecurity uh, came up as a real uh, career option for me. And, and it was it was from the, uh, you know, we would, at, at the Secret Service, we would go out on search warrants a lot. And we would seize computers. Mm-hmm. We, you know, we start, started turning up with a bunch of computers whenever we, we would uh, go on a search warrant. And all of my peers had degrees in criminal justice, mm-hmm. right? So, and I had a degree in mechanical engineering. Uh, so the criminal justice guys, the senior agents, and all of my peers would say, Look, you got a degree in engineering. Mm-hmm. We have all these computers. Do something. Uh, so that's when I started, you know, examining uh, computers. And headquarters found out and said, <clears throat> "Hey, do you want to be a uh, electronic crime special agent?" A bit of a long story there, but eventually I said yes. It took mm-hmm. a little bit, mm-hmm. but eventually I said yes. Uh, and so after my training and and then uh, doing a bunch of uh, uh, hardware exploitations and things like that. Uh, that set me on the path for cybersecurity as a career field. But you got your degree, I believe you studied mechanical engineering at yeah. West Point. And I'm a person that believes that all degree fields, all areas, all studies is applicable to cybersecurity. If you're an artist, there's definitely some artistry in, in protection and in the, in the offensive and the defensive side. What part of mechanical engineering do you think has played a role in your role as a CISO or how you think? Yeah, so you would think it's the, uh, you know, the computer science part, so we had to take computer science classes. And it really wasn't that. It's just the, you know, the engineering thinking, mm-hmm. uh, thinking your way through a problem uh, and bringing that to um, examining machines uh, and then taking that further on into the productive things that we do in security. Okay, okay. I, you know, I, I stick to, I stick to that. You know, there's always something, a bit of every field within cybersecurity, within everything that we do. And I think it broadens your scope when you have people that come in with different, different thought processes, different idea, different areas and, and ways of thinking. So I definitely get that. Um, but I also think that sometimes your experience tends to lend a lot as well. And so you have, I know, we share some some common uh, interest in government um, and that you came from Secret Service as well. You just mentioned that. How has your position from Secret Service helped you and as a CISO as well? Yeah. So um, the perspective that I picked up as an agent, um, I understand how uh, an enforcement entity would be looking at evidence um, through my experience at the Secret Service. So so, um, for advanced uh, device exploitation, they took us through through a national uh, security agency. Mm -hmm. My my advanced uh, evidence recovery comes from the NSA. Uh, So just the the under the base understanding that I have about the uh, cyber domain comes from uh, my time in the Secret Service. Mm -hmm. Right. So you know, going from all of the layers, all of the stacks, and understanding, you know, how data moves from one end to the other. Uh, that helps me when it comes to looking at 
Uh, if I have a new, there's a new product that our company wants to launch, what are the angles and opportunities that someone could take advantage of them to, uh, to break them or cause harm? So now we're talking about a transition from, we talked about West Point, we've talked about Secret Service, and now, you know, as we transition into thinking about private sector, we see a lot of military leaders that are using their, you know, strong technology and security backgrounds and helping to make decisions and help to make the switch. What led you to your decision to move from government to private sector? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I, I loved being an agent. A mm -hmm. um, couple things. A um, couple years before I'd been involved in a shooting, I had to shoot someone. Uh, and then when 9 11 happened, um, you know, I was working in DC mm -hmm. and there was just so much going on. Uh, and I had a young family. Uh, and I had to make a decision that, you know, I got to go in and do my job, which is leaving my family out here. Um, so just all of that, uh, my wife was uh, somewhat uh, uh, concerned about, you know, my safety. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, she kind of pointed out that, you know, hey, have a great uh, we've been having a great time in the Secret Service, but we need to think about the long term uh, things for the family. Mm -hmm. uh, so we might need to rethink this. And then uh, in addition to that, you know, there's life in the private sector. There's there is a lot more control. I can tell you of times while I was an agent that, you know, it could be a Saturday afternoon and literally Saturday afternoon, I'm floating around in our pool and I get a call that says, hey, I got to run to the airport because I got to work uh, from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. Mm -hmm. But then I could come back home. So you have no control mm -hmm. over your life in that, that particular job. Uh, so those things are it's just quality of life. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Uh, because of those quality of life things, I, I chose to go private sector. So, you know, I have I was the deputy CIO of the White House. And in that position, I always felt I was always on. Mm -hmm. There was never a time that I was off. Um, as I transitioned to the CISO role, there's still a part of me that thinks I'm always on. <laughs> yeah. How do you manage that? How do you how do you level that off? So you're you're always on. You you are. But. I have more control over my day. Mm -hmm. I have control over where I'm at. Absolutely. I can, I can choose to be at a location or not. So the whole day you're on, but you have more control over your life than when you are in the government. Because oftentimes uh, you could be in situations that are pretty much life or death, mm -hmm. which you probably aren't in that situation in the private sector. Right. So I want to kind of kind of slide a few a few other thoughts in cuz you know we're in this always on environment and now which leads us to an always connected environment. Mm -hmm. How do we tackle that now as CISOs being always connected and having employees and staff that are always connected and then wanting to connect more? Um, that is, uh, that's just a change overall that, uh, you know, we as, you know, people of the world have to get used to. Um, so for the people that are part of your team, you got to ensure that they have the time to, uh, spend with their family. You know, we do all of this, all of this work that we do, it's because of the families that we have. And if we forget about the family, then why are we doing this? Right. Right. So you, you do have to just concentrate make the time uh, when your kids are growing up. Mm -hmm. If you don't take the time, you know, time, time's not going to wait for you. Right. It, life's going to pass you by and you're going to miss out on some great opportunities. So you got to, you got to be thoughtful about taking the time for yourself and for your family. So you've been responsible for security at federal agencies, at Research in Motion, at Bank of America, at uh, various enterprises and various sizes of enterprises, and now as the chief security officer um, at MasterCard, what are the biggest differences in, in you know, forgetting about our discussion about Internet of Things, because that's always going to be a, big, a, a huge difference from where we started. Right. What are the biggest differences between trying to c uh, protect all of those different enterprises? The, uh, the thing that's of value is different. Um, the attack 
the attackers are different. Mm-hmm. Um, so when it comes to working at a bank or at MasterCard, um, there's something that people want, and it, it's the money, mm-hmm. right? So mm-hmm. uh, you're dealing uh, the threat. The prominent threat for you and those institutions is fraudsters. Um, when you think about a technology company like uh, a BlackBerry that was servicing uh, federal agencies throughout the U.S. and uh, government agencies throughout the world, uh, it's not money that the adversary is after. Mm-hmm. It's you know, it's the intellectual property, or it's trying to break that communication. So the at- the attackers are different. Um, in the the financial services sector, uh, people probably won't like that I say this, but uh, hackers that steal for fraud purposes, they help to keep us on game, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So they're always pushing, and the results of their success are quick to manifest themselves, right? Mm-hmm. So we have the luxury of they attacked, and if they if they score a hit or a win, they're quick to run and make profit on it, where if you have an adversary that's looking at for intellectual property or uh, looking to, you know, break into the communication, mm-hmm. um, they're not going to be so obvious. Mm-hmm. You won't. You may not know that they're there. Right. Which is, you know, the fraudsters that that helps us get better. If you just have adversaries that are interested in IP and things like that, they're so slow. They're not going to help you get better. At all. Right. 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 I think it's the aggressiveness of competition. I think in the competitive side, the competitive side of the CISO and the and the security organization, as well as the fighting against the competitive side of the adversary. Yeah. It really is the it, you really have to have that spirit of competition and wanting to win and always wanting to fight the fight. It, it makes it fun. It, it makes I mean, it fun. That's why this is all uh, so much fun. And even the people that aren't in the security space when you talk about uh, what it is that your team is doing, you could you know, the mm-hmm. little light goes on mm-hmm. in their little eyes and uh, they'd like to join in the fight as well. Right. So so talk about the fight at MasterCard, you know, what, whatever you're willing to share in terms of scope and breadth. I know, um, you know, about the, the depth and breadth of, of the team, but I think it's interesting and has some great perspective for some of the other CISOs out there. Sure. Uh, so MasterCard's a company of uh, about 20,000 mm-hmm. employees, and uh, our security st- team stands at about 650 people that are a part of the organization, which is a really good mm-hmm. uh, ratio. Um, we are so our CEO is known uh, for uh, you know just his expertise in security as part of uh, the Obama administration cybersecurity mm-hmm. advisory uh, council, um, and so I get tons of support in that 650 person team. You know, we have all of the things that you expect out of a security organization mm-hmm. from vulnerability management to incident response uh, to governance, risk, and compliance. But, you know, we also have a fusion center. Mm-hmm. Um, we also have um, a forensic lab that uh, is ANAB certified. Uh, don't ask me what ANAB mm-hmm. means. <laughs> it, it, it's, uh, it used to be the uh, American Society for uh, Crime Labs Laboratory Accreditation Board. But they turned that into A and A B, but it's the same accreditation that FBI and other mm-hmm. uh, criminal labs uh, carry. Uh, that shows that they're, you know, there's expertise, there's quality in the work that they do. We're one of nine companies that bear that same accreditation. We have a cyber range. We do some pretty cool stuff with mm-hmm. that 650 person team. We also have uh, regional security officers that support Europe, Asia Pac, Middle East Africa, and Latin America. Uh, in addition to the business security officers that I have supporting the various lines of business. So I hear a lot of different verticals. Like I said, the the, the depth and breadth of, and scope is amazing to me. I get a lot of questions from CISOs always asking and having me look at their organization and say, how do I know I got this right? How do you know you have it right? And, and is there a right? Yeah. Uh, it's a... Journey. It is. Right? Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. And your adversaries and events will always test and find something that you might not have thought of before. But mm-hmm. you need to you need to uh, take your best shot of making sure you have it all in, in, in encompassed. So right. here, here's how I think about it. First, there's um, leveraging security frameworks to look at, you know, just best practice of what have you got covered. We use a unified compliance framework. And the reason we've gone that route is, 
you know, choosing any one particular framework uh, leaves us with gaps. Right. Uh, we get evaluated by uh, uh, regulators and central banks and customers, and they all use a, some basis of a framework. Uh, so we we get to look at many frameworks through our unified compliance framework. Uh, then I have to look at how I'm supporting the business. And mm-hmm. at MasterCard, um, we have some definite business vertical lines, and so I have to make sure I'm providing them the security value that they need. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, su- I need to support them by through our business security uh, 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 enablement program with business security officers and all, all of that. You know, we're in over 200 con- countries around the globe, and we're very uh, close to our customers. So I need to be supporting our regions and our customers where they are, mm-hmm. which is the regional security uh, officer program that I have. Uh, so having those, having uh, standardized frameworks covered, covering off on the different ends of the business, mm-hmm. um, I, I feel comfortable that we're in a good place. So one of the things I tell my my staff, the one of the philosophies or kind of quotes that I always use, and this is comes from a book that I'm reading right now, Good to Great, says, good is the enemy of great. And I tell my team that all the time. What security, What philosophy do you use to help drive the security team? Yeah, so it, that security is more than just our security team. It's everybody's responsibility at MasterCard. And we've been you know, very focused on uh, helping the organization adjust their culture to think about security and everything that they do. Mm-hmm. In fact, our awareness program is bent on uh, helping our employees understand how to secure themselves. Right. Uh, so they bring that uh, then uh, to us uh, to protect MasterCard. So first, the security is everybody's responsibility. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then secondly, um, we have to be enablers of the business, which means you know you can have a zero you can have a zero security risk philosophy. And the quickest way to remove all security risks is just turn, turn all the, everything turn off. Turn everything off. <laughs> let everybody go home. Right. Um, so we have to help make the right risk decisions. There's mm-hmm. no such thing as zero risk. Right. But there's also stupidity. So we, we right. can't let stupid things happen. Uh, and then everything else is a conversation to get to, to the right level of risk. Right. Right. So you know we talk about our people. And you just talked about how security is really the entire company, right? Is the security organization. That's a very, very valid point. Um, There is a cybersecurity ventures predicts that by 2021, 3.5 million unfilled cybersecurity positions will be out there. And I know you have, you know, a a, a relatively large team. Um, Is that something that you are still faced with, a challenge that still persists, even though, you know, from the outside, you know, a CISO like me is like, oh, my gosh, 650 people, I'd love that, you know. But, you know, from the inside, you may say, wow, the the fight that we're fighting is huge and it's difficult and we've got to take it to task. Are you feeling the same pressures that everyone is feeling in terms of the difficulty to re- recruit and the difficulty to retain? Yeah, it's so the uh, uh, the problem is real. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, um, we do have we've had roles that it's taken us two years mm-hmm. uh, to fill, mm-hmm. um, but that's when we're looking for you know specialized talent. And you know when you get to you know specialized areas like cloud, right? Uh, access, and you, you get to where you're looking for certain uh, skill sets, it gets really hard. Mm-hmm. Um, part of part of what we think about is not just trying to find that experienced person, you got to build them. You also got to prime the pump. You got to get the pipeline right. going. Uh, so we, you know, we do a lot of things like uh, Cyber Patriot mm-hmm. uh, to help, you know, get kids to think about cybersecurity as a field. Because uh, like I said, cybersecurity wasn't anywhere in right. uh, what I was thinking about. Right. Um, I think most of my vintage, uh, we all just kind of, we found our way here. Mm-hmm. But um, we have to do more to get just that this is here out to younger folks. Mm-hmm. Um, we have uh, the Cyber Talent Initiative mm-hmm. where uh, it's MasterCard, it's uh, Microsoft and Workday. Mm-hmm. But we all realize there's this you know shortage of cybersecurity talent in the workforce that we're dealing with now that we'll uh, face for years to come. 
our cyber talent initiative is one where we're looking to get more partners. And how it works is uh, if a student uh, chooses to go in a cybersecurity field uh, and obtain a degree in that, in that space, they can then go to work for the federal government. Um, so we have partners like the Department of Defense, the CIA, mm-hmm. uh, the FBI. Um, there's 11 federal agencies right now that we have guaranteed positions with. Mm-hmm. Uh, the student then goes to work for the federal government for two years. So from college to the federal government for two years. At the end of that two years, they come to work for us for two years. And across that two-year period, we'll pay off their student debt. So, I wish yeah. that was available when I was in school. <laughs> it's, it's available now. And, and <laughs> in fact, you can – kids, you know, folks that are interested in it, mm-hmm. uh, this is for bachelors and it's even for uh, masters or, uh, you know, more advanced degrees – um, but you can apply at uh, cybertalentinitiative.org. Um, you go there. Um, the uh, At the end of October is when the first cohorts applications have to be in. Mm-hmm. This summer is when uh, those students then go into the federal government. They gotta they gotta go through the backgrounds. Right. They gotta do right. all of that, uh, all of those things to become an employee of the federal government. But that's when our first cohort goes through. And if your company that's interested in it, just you know, reach out to me or. Uh, reach out through the uh, the web page, and we'll get you uh, brought into the partnership. That is that is amazing. You know, I, I I always tell people that you know it's not just a people problem, but it's having the right people, having the right talent in place, and it's initiatives like that that help us have have a pool of the right talent. Can you talk a little bit? I've heard about Girls for Tech. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So uh, with Girls for Tech, so Girls for Tech is an initiative that MasterCard um, has been a founding uh, sponsor of and founding member of. Um, uh, we actually just went through building out the cybersecurity uh, and artificial intelligence uh, program uh, for Girls for Tech. So mm-hmm. Girls for Tech uh, helps to uh, bring uh, girls, women into um, the technology workforce, mm-hmm. um, it, but in the cyber side, uh, if you think about all the jobs that are out there, about only about twenty percent of those are filled by by women. Mm-hmm. Um, so we want to make sure that we're bringing uh, it, you are able to make the best of decisions when you bring uh, voices from across the spectrum mm-hmm. into the conversation to help you think through your problems. And you know, not having women at the table is a is mm-hmm. a significant problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we're trying to, through Girls for Tech, help to, you know, address that issue by bringing uh, just the opportunities, uh, exposing those to uh, young girls so that they can think about technology as a career field, but also cybersecurity and artificial intelligence. Right. I think there's so much <laughs> opportunity in in technology, and then an extension of that in cybersecurity. Um, that um, if we if we start at the youth that will help us with the shortage. There's nothing's going to help us with the shortage right now. Yeah. Like in the, yeah. the, 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 the 3.5 million and by 2021, we will not have those jobs filled. <laughs> yeah. But now these programs are helping with the future problems, the problem that we're going to have once AI really is pervasive across everything that we do. Once, you know, machine learning really takes hold and becomes more natural, more, more of a natural phenomenon to us and not just a right now. I think a lot of people still think of it as a phenomenon. Um, but when it's really embedded in our ecosystem, I think these will help us with those potential problems yeah. that we're going to have in the future. Yeah, and it's really not a phenomenon. It's uh, it's part of everyone's everyday life. Right. Everywhere, right? And so, uh, But no one thinks of it as no, that. No, no. No one thinks of it as that. When, but when we leave our house today, what do we do? We lock the door. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if we go out on vacation and we want to leave lights on. It, right. We have all these things that, they are they are now a part of us, um, but we haven't thought about the cyber spectrum. Mm-hmm. Uh, so bringing it to, you know, I, I've heard of you know K to gray. You got to think about K right, to gray. Right, right. Uh, so you got to bring this knowledge uh, into the younger younger crowds. I mean, look at it. They're they're going off on their iPads mm-hmm. and they're, they're running all around the internet. Right. Uh, but yet. 
I don't know that they understand the basics of security. The basic, not mm-hmm. everybody on the internet is going to tell you the truth. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. As we wrap this up, sure. I want to make sure you have an opportunity to share either you know what your top two things that you want to leave with people. I always you know kind of think I'd, I'd like for you to think about it from two perspectives. One from a leadership perspective to other CISOs that may be listening, and the other from an employee perspective for people who are, who are listening and and just within the the cybersecurity industry and what they may be thinking. Two little nuggets that you may be able to share with those people. Yeah. So uh, the first one, just along the lines of leadership, um, I, I think just as part of my style, uh, part of you know from being a platoon leader. Uh, to being an agent, to all of my roles uh, throughout the private sector. Um, we're fortunate uh, to have people that are on our teams. Mm-hmm. Um, they're not fortunate to have us as leader. We're fortunate to have them right. on our teams. Uh, and within those, w- within the people that are uh, part of your teams, they have great ideas. Uh, they have uh, capabilities that can really uh, take you and your organization forward. You got to take the time to listen and help them to develop those ideas mm-hmm. and bring those uh, ideas to the table to help the organization move forward. Because mm-hmm. uh, I've I haven't been in an organization where the right ideas weren't already there; mm-hmm. they just didn't have the voice. Mm-hmm. And that's the biggest thing I think about leadership wise. You got to help the team uh, deliver on those ideas. Mm-hmm. Uh, my biggest the biggest thing I do is I remove the hurdles from them. I also translate for them, but uh, <laughs> I remove their hurdles. Mm-hmm. Uh, and as uh, someone that's thinking about, uh, I think just thinking about your career in general, uh, you got to have a goal. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I think about the goals that I've set over uh, my lifetime. I'm going to be a uh, cop. Right. Uh, I'm going to be a soldier. Mm-hmm. No, I'm going to be a cop. Uh, I'm going to be a CISO. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you set a goal, and then you plan how do you get to the, how do you achieve that goal? Um, because it's really up to you to drive your career. If you're if you're sitting back and thinking, well, my manager's gonna uh, take care of my career for me. That's it. Really, is your responsibility to take care of your own career. Uh, so think about what you want to do, and then start to plan how you get there. And if you're not sure how to get there, then talk to your manager or talk to someone that you know that's uh, been successful about how the how did they how did they get there or what are their thoughts about your career path. Absolutely amazing! Thank you so much. It has been an extreme pleasure, Ron, to sit and ask you these questions. Thank you for coming on to the CISO. Ask the CISO. Uh, Alyssa, thank you for having me, and really appreciate it. No problem. Thanks. All right.